Well, we are here, contrary to popular belief. Or demand. Not make it. <laughs> what do you, what do you make, uh, come on, what are you talking about? This life is pretty good these days. Yeah, well, every, every day is important when you get to a certain point, you know? Well, you know, it's like what, what Carl Reiner said. When I get up in the morning, have my breakfast, I read the old bits, my name's not in it, it's a good day. It's a good day. <laughs> uh, Shannon is in uh, Edmonton still. Yes, sir. On um, uh, assignment. A special assignment for um, CSIS, I think. <laughs> oh, um, his day, I, I was actually part of the Euler uh, Maple Leaf broadcast for Western Canada last night. So. Well, you know, that's interesting you brought that up. I wasn't going to mention that, but I, I was flipping the dial last night and um, Sportsnet actually carried both broadcasts. Yeah, yeah. Any I particular guess, I guess reason why they would do that? Well, because... I mean, Cuthbert's, the, Cuthbert's broadcast is the Sportsnet broadcast. It's not a Maple Leaf broadcast, is it? It's a Sportsnet it? broadcast. It's a Sportsnet broadcast, as is the one that Jack Michaels did the play-by-play for uh, for Sportsnet West last night. The, the real reason, Bob, is, is that uh, it's a non-national night, so uh, oh, all right. of the sponsorships, it's, a sp it's all about sponsorships. So all of the billboards, right. all of the commercials... Uh, all of the affiliations that are, you know, product placements that are that are used on the Euler broadcast for Edmonton are completely different than the ones used for the Maple Leaf region. Gotcha. Uh, onward with the program. He um, is one of the great coaches of all time. He is uh, in the Hockey Hall of Fame, um, Scotty Bowman. And if you haven't heard Bowman with us, uh, be prepared because <laughs> anything can happen. And we'll find out what happens this time after these messages. And uh, here we go. Bob McCowan, John Shannon for this uh, lovely day. A, a warmer day. Not as warm as it is in Florida, I'm guessing, though. Uh, joining us from there, he needs no introduction. But I'll give him one anyway. Scotty Bowman is uh, with us. Mr. Bowman, weather's good there, I assume? Yeah, we got another... Uh... Cold wave coming Friday. It's going to go down in the 50s. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bundle up. <laughs> oh. That means no shorts, Scotty. No shorts. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't change. That's during the night, I'm sure. Uh, we know you um, You watch hockey um, at night, all night, um, at least a couple of games a night, isn't it? Well, sometimes it's about six or eight. <laughs> no, I, you get about three in because I don't, I don't like jumping around, Bob. I try to pick. I try to pick a, a game that I'd like to see. And uh, of course, the late game, you know, there's not as much of a choice, but you know, sometimes 10 30, it ends at one o'clock. How much are you uh, watching this uh, Northern Division, Scotty? I watch it a lot because, uh, you know, uh, well, all the divisions, uh, John, is, is we've kind of sorted out uh, with uh, the top three. You know, it's, it's, it's the same in, in all the divisions. I mean, it's Winnipeg now, Edmonton, and Toronto. Or, but Montreal's got so many games to play. It's going to be a battle. I mean, you know, for to get uh, get all those the only, games. Done. The only way the only way that it it works is if they win them all. You know that. No, you're look, right look, the point. Look what's happened to Dallas. Look at that. Yeah. Dallas had hordes of games in hand too, right? Yeah, it's that they they've really suffered. You're right, and now they got a lot of games. I think I saw it. Montreal had, is it right? 25 games in 43 nights? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's yeah. tough. They have six games in hand on Calgary. Yeah, I was thinking about the hockey. You know, not that it, a lot of people don't have a, a, a summer, but this will be two summers in a row. I mean, we're, that there'll be no summer. And then, because they want to start next year, a clean, they want to try to start a clean slate, but they're going to play into July, so... It's going to be a, a mixed up deal, but when you're making a lot of money, I guess you have to do it. <laughs> well, but there's a presumption here that COVID is going to be under control by the fall. And that we've sort of been operating with that. And uh, now we're seeing spikes here in Canada and there are spikes in the U S as well. Um, you know, in spite of the fact that people are getting the shot, um, people aren't behaving. Things are still open. Although BC is shut down. Have they not John or, or, as of yesterday, they till April nineteenth, they 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 basically closed the door, indoor dining, lots of uh, gatherings over more than ten people. You know, Whistler's uh, basically closed down to, until until April nineteenth. Yeah, hockey has not traditionally, though, Scotty, um, rested players 
uh, for extended periods, even you know, occasionally. I mean, it does happen in some in, in some instances, but it's not part of the culture to give players um, a night off. Well, if you were coaching today, given the kind of schedule that Montreal is facing over the next six weeks, would you be inclined to rest players? Well, I I, I never got involved much with resting. I I found out, Bob, even down down the stretch when you were. Uh, getting ready for the playoffs, the players, they, they didn't want, I mean, I, I took their ice time down a little bit, but they wanted to get in the routine and keep going. And I mean, of course, that's the way I was brought up because I could just give you a quick, quick story, <laughs> a quick story about St. Louis blues. Uh, I think it was in my uh, second year because uh, Jacques Plant was, uh, was, was with us. And uh, we, we were well ahead of uh, the next team and we had a, West Coast, two games, Oakland and Los Angeles, and uh, LA was was not. They were pretty in, uh, ready to to finish. Uh, they were in the playoffs. Oakland wasn't. We went to LA, and it was the last game of the year. We and uh, Jacques was injured, and I was going to play our back. We had a third goalie used to travel with us, a young kid. We had three young kids, and two of them played in Kansas City, and we kept one as a practice goalie. And uh, I got a call in the morning of the of the game, the last game of the season. From president Clarence Campbell just saying um I expect you to play your strongest lineup tonight you understand that Mr. Bowman I said I do Mr. <laughs> Campbell and I had a bit of a dilemma because Blunt was injured and I wanted to rest Glenn Hall and uh, I did go to Glenn and I said you know Glenn I'm in a tough spot because we, we can't rest players we couldn't rest players in those days the president Campbell was right on you I mean you you had to be careful and uh but we, I haven't rested many players, but I mean, I think what you'd probably want to do now, if you're one of those teams that's in the top three spots, at least there's pretty well, we can pretty well see three, three, three teams in each, in each division that are going to make it. Um, you'd probably be careful if they had injuries. I would be careful about taking a chance because what hang, if you finish one, two or three or four, you're going to play, a, you know, you're going to play a pretty good team. And when you a, get, to, when, you, when you, when you get into this, type of year time of year and we're going to call this the race for a playoff spot mm -hmm. um how much would you practice because that's to me with games every second day it's uh, the practice time that's gone you, you know, and you didn't, you, you, you didn't you didn't want to practice did you well i liked it i mean i i liked the practices i i i mean it was different in my day but i i i was just brought up with that that you you play like you practice and i was pretty stickler i didn't like long practices I liked quick practices. I liked just giving a nice spinner out there, get a few good drills in, get your power play going, whatever you want to do. But no, I I, I think now it's they're not practicing. I mean, they're doing a lot of video now. I, I'm not involved in that, but they're doing video uh, sessions with the with the with the players. And uh, but it's it's all you're right. It's it. I mean, an interesting will be the Florida Panthers now with the loss of. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, they have a nice cushion. Is, is there anything that's, is a cushion good enough? I mean, it's hard to say. Some team could, Nashville's moving along pretty good right now. They're playing, they're playing like they were, people thought they were at the beginning of the year. But, uh, you know, it'll be, a, it'll be a good observation on the Panthers if they could, because he was such an important player. And Joel, Joel really, uh, he's got a, he's got a defense core that joins the rush all the time. They're, they're, it's a pretty good system because, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a defenseman, you go up on the rush and it's up to a forward to, to replace you. And they have a lot of speed, but he was an important player. I mean, he turned his game right around from what he was uh, as a rookie. It was great, but last couple of years, he hasn't been able to do it. You're, you're talking about Aaron Eckblad, who had surgery and yeah. with a, a, a fractured yeah. leg, uh, a game in Dallas. Uh, you, you saw him, uh, you, you talked about uh, his game. He had gone to another level. He really had, hadn't he? It was this was the kid we expected to see after that first year. Yeah, they're they're, they're they've really attained. Uh, they, they've got a lot of speed. I mean, it's just it's been a great story because I got to know Joel, and he's an excellent coach. And you know, it, it, like all coaches, uh, sometimes you run out of run out of time with teams. And but he's turned that around. I mean, Ver, Verhage, that player they picked up from. Uh, from Tampa, boy, he's he's got a lot of speed. I know people that know him, and there's a good illustration. They said he started in the East Coast League, and he, and his problem was he he wasn't that fast enough, and now he's as fast as you can get. So, 
hope for anybody that doesn't matter if how, how slow they are, they seem to get faster. <laughs> With Scotty Bowman, is Florida the biggest surprise so far that you've seen? Oh, sure. I mean, for what I mean, I had them in the playoffs. They're battling for the playoffs, but now they're battling for first place. And uh, I mean, when no, I think another team that's really come up uh, from the ashes really is uh, Los Angeles. The Kings have, have seemed to, I mean, you know, uh, I know Todd McClellan. I mean, he didn't do it in, in Edmonton, but, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, their their veteran core has had a rebirth. When you look at all those players like Brown and Doughty and Kopitar and even Carter, they, they've now taken the mantle. I mean, usually the, it's tough when those older players have won, and they've won cups too. They won two cups, those guys. And uh, so, I mean, that's been a good story. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the surprise list, uh, Winnipeg really surprised me that uh, they could they've lost a lot of defensemen in the last three four years but they they see it they got the goaltending uh, it's been one of the top three for sure uh, Halifax's been terrific and they're, they're 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 really a great offensive team now and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for them because I like Chevy I, he's done a good job you know he's got a limited uh, budget there sometimes although they're spending out of the cap. But he's, he's done a great job. And Paul Maurice, you know, I think he's probably the most underrated coach in the league because I coached against him in 2002. We don't really, mm -hmm. that's 19 years ago. And he was coaching before that. So um, he, he's got them playing the right way. And uh, they're going to be, they're going to be a pretty good, you get that kind of goaltending. I'm su totally surprised where they, their defense core, how they could, how they could do what they, what they're doing, you know. The, uh, the interesting thing about Winnipeg is, is that, they, they have, you know, I would argue, everybody talks top six and bottom six forwards. I don't know why, but they do. Uh, but they have, they have, no, I don't know. I mean, who decides that the, that, that the third line isn't as good as the second line? But that, that's what Paul has. And Paul has interchange, such interchangeable parts. You know, they, they lost in Calgary on the weekend with Wheeler playing with Stastny and Shifley. Ah, let's change it. Then we're going to put we're going to put Shifley with Connor and and Ehlers, and all of a sudden Eureka last night they were brilliant. In yeah, playing, I, I get I get mixed up between I don't know why I get mixed up between Cop and Connors. You know, oh, I mean, yeah. no, but uh, Connor is probably the most underrated player in the league. I mean, you know, for production he gives them, and like last night I watched that Calgary game and. You know, they just got the scoring that, that can make it. They, they, they can put the puck in the net. They got, it's, it's really a, a good team to watch. And you're right. And uh, they, they're going to give a good run to somebody. I mean, Toronto and, and, uh, and Winnipeg and Edmonton. And Edmonton, they, you know, like those coaches like Dave Tippett, he's been around a long time. And he's, he's you know, what they have is they, they've been able to get their defense now. Barry, Barry's done a good job. Barry's done a good job for them, and and when you take uh, Nurse now with, with his eleven goals, uh, and that's well, what that's they, they Scotty, twelve, twelve now is that was it? They Wait, need they won last night. Yeah. yeah, they need that. They need that uh, defense core because you know, the way McDavid and Drysital can handle games, uh, they need that defense, that core coming up, and that's what they did last night, and of course in overtime, but three on three. I I, uh, I know Dave Tepper and he's he's got that team playing the right way. If their goaltending can, you know, Smith Smith made a big save on Matthews to, to preserve that uh, chance to win. You guys were talking about line shuffling. Um, my recollection of the days when you were coaching Scotty was that I mean lines became famous. They had nicknames and they stayed yeah. together. But was there, did you do line sh much line shuffling when you were were coaching, or is that a, a kind of a, almost a new thing? I always tried to keep at least two, uh, two players together. I did change players. I wanted to put the players. I think it's important. It's not as, it's not as easy now because the, the length of shift and uh, it doesn't seem to be the, the mantra that a lot of teams were as the, the older coaches will be concerned who plays against two. But I think Bob, the thing is I always wanted to put a player, whatever his ability is, whether he's a defensive player or an offensive player, Put him in a, a position that he can succeed. So I mean, if if you've got a top offensive player, you you got to try to put him. You know, I mean, if he's been you know really handy, hand, handicapped by the good defensive forward on the other team, 
maybe shift them around a little bit. And uh, you just can't give the other team everything they want. And sometimes teams now they can the the the, the experienced coaches they they can get what they want because the, not everybody worries about. And, and it's hard to change now on the fly because if you do, you're at a disadvantage. You lose your forecheck, and also you could end up, uh, you know, they don't, the shorts, the shifts are so short now, 30, 40 second shifts. And uh, if you're changing on the fly all the time, you, you're not playing the game. Bob let, me tell you, Bob, let me tell you a story about Scotty. So this is 1993. And the game was evolving in the old days, and not to date myself, in the old days, commercials in television and hockey used to be 30 seconds long. And you used to have six or seven 30 second commercials in a game. Well, we changed that in the early 90s to a minute for one minute breaks. And we're doing the Stanley Cup final and Scotty's coaching the Penguins. And in the conference final, we got invited over, a couple of us in the production side got invited over to the Penguins coaches room from the hotel uh, to watch the other conference game. And Scotty's sitting there, a couple of other guys, Pierre Maguire's there. I think a couple other coaches are there with us and we're watching the other game and Scotty's got a stopwatch on. And I figure Scotty's sitting there timing shifts of, you know, whoever's the other team they're going to be playing from the Western conference. I guess, was it, who was that? Was that Chicago? I guess that was Chicago. Probably Chicago. Um, so, uh, and then Scotty turns to me and says, uh, Hey, John, that commercial was 107. I said, what? <laughs> no, that commercial, that was that commercial wasn't a minute. It was 107. Um, he wasn't timing the players. He was timing the commercials because, and this is to talk a little bit about what you just talked about, Scotty, was coaches now you know how to use the commercial timeouts, which are now two minutes long. Yeah, they are. Three two-minute commercials. They know how to use the time, the commercial breaks yeah. so that, they can rest their stars and they don't play the fourth line as much. And you can get a chance to put well, in Edmonton's case, McDavid and dry out one more time or Shifley and Wheeler out one more time. And it becomes the tactics of the game, but there's Bowman sitting in his office at the Penguins. And, and I thought he would be a nice to invite us over to watch the game. He's coming over there to give me shit. Well, yeah, of course he was. <laughs> That's why you got the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't understand. You dumb but, dumb. Uh, but, uh, but Bob, the other one, I, I don't know if John was involved. He might have been, but it was probably the U.S. side. But uh, I was thinking of Tim Peel last week, the, the unfortunate incident. And uh, they, uh, the coach association had a hard time making, making it with the league. You know, I was, Pat Quinn was the first. It was Pat Quinn, myself, and Al Arbor. We tried hard to get something going. We couldn't get, we could hardly get an interview. So we, we kind of all got tired of trying. And then now it's very strong. I mean, the, the, the referees association is really, really strong. And the coaches are doing better. And, they, and they've had to give in some things. And like, so the first time they wanted us to do interviews, they wanted us to put mics on. And it was, I think it was the NBC though, was in, it was in the final. I, I, did, I didn't feel comfortable at all. I mean, I'm trying to coach the team and I got a mic on. And so the, the, some young, young, uh, you know, was maybe an intern come and handed me the, the, put me, put the wire on, put the mic on and put the thing on my, on my head to take my jacket off and put it in there. And he showed me, he said, now here's, here's the volume and you just keep it up. So as soon as the game, and he said, it's all, we only agreed to do it for one period, the first period. So I, I'm sure it was NBC. It wasn't John. So anyways, um, <laughs> I, I couldn't take it. I started the game, so I just took the volume and turned it off. And of course, nobody, now you couldn't do it because they, they have a special guy to do it. So at the end of the period, the guy comes out, they, you know, they come up to me and said, you know, I said, how did it go? Did it go okay? And the guy said, no, well, I don't know. Something happened to it. I said, well, I don't know. I tried hard. But that, that, but I thought of Tim Peel, the poor, poor guy last week. Too bad he couldn't have just, you know. But yeah. I'm wondering, sometimes the referees, when they go to report a, a, a goal, they must have some volume. Sometimes you don't hear it. I, I'm convinced that Tim left his, his, the switch on, his microphone on. I'm convinced oh, he left the switch on. So, so they do have a, they was, have a switch. They have yeah, a they switch. have a switch. I think yeah, I, there was a little bit of oper, operator error in the system. So now well, when they do, watch, an they do the interview with the coach, they come and south, though. They, yeah. they don't. Well, they're not now because of this year, but it's the inner, you know, when you're being interviewed and is it usually it's, it's in a stoppage, isn't it? 
yeah. the two minutes. Yeah. 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 If you see, if you watch the NFL, you'll see the, uh, the referee when he's uh, calling a penalty or making a call to the public he's always trying. reaches yeah. over and, yeah. and turns yeah. this thing on. And I, same thing in the NHL, you stay in this business long enough. You're going to get caught with a mic open when you don't oh, expect yeah. it. It's an inevitability. And, you know, we're supposed to be professionals. And I, hold, and the, the key phrase on, here is supposed to be. The only professional here is Scotty, and it's not being a broadcaster, just being a no. professional coach. So, well, perhaps <laughs> I didn't question that for a second. Uh, but but I, everybody forgets from now, now and again. Hey, you know, you, know, you, you brought up Paul Maurice uh, in 2002. If memory serves me, um, Another little uh, Scotty anecdote is that uh, you guys are on the verge of winning your your Stanley Cup that year against the Hurricanes, uh, and the the buzzer goes and you disappear. Right, you go to the dressing room. Which game? Am I right, that? Scotty? Which your, your game? Your last game in Detroit. Last game in Detroit. Oh, you go oh, to the yeah, dressing room. Yeah, we had to put your net. skates on after the empty net goal. Yeah, after the, after the game's still on, yeah. you leave the you leave the bench to go to the dressing yeah. room and put your skates on. Brendan, well, it was they were all ready to put on. It was just it was a three to one with about 10, 20 seconds. Brendan Shannon scored the empty net goal. Yeah, that, I remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> Claude Ruel, you, skate- you know Claude Claude Ruel in a playoff game again. That's what the year you know he he came in and coached and won the cup. And then, and then 69, uh, huh? 69. 69. And then the next year, during one of the playoff games, he could, he couldn't hardly take it. And he, he left the bench. He, he couldn't, you know, he did. He did he, it's the same thing as, of course, we all know the tragic loss of Bob Plager uh, last week in St. Louis. And, uh, and I, and, and I, I, I was texting a lot with Bob over the last few years. And I, I, I saw him, I saw him uh, last year. They showed him a p- picture of him. And he was not, he left the, the place because, you know, he was, he was a, a good celebrity with the blues and he went into the office or something. They showed him in a corridor and then I text him and I said, Bob, Bob, you, you can't, you've got to start watching the game. I mean, this is an important game and, you know, you, you we're hoping that team can win. And that was against uh, two years ago against the, uh, the Bruins. And, and uh, I said, uh, you know, you're, if it's like me, I said, I, I said, you're, you're sort of like when you were playing, I said, I couldn't, I used to, I used to want to leave the bench. I didn't want to watch you, but that's true. Bob, <laughs> Bob, Bob used to, Bob used to take off. He couldn't watch the game. He was nervous. And Claude Ruel did the same thing in Minnesota one night in a playoff game. Scotty Bowman is with us. Take a quick break. We'll come back more with the legendary former coach, uh, hall of famer after these messages. Bob McCowan, John Shannon with you. Uh, Scotty Bowman is uh, with us from Florida. We were talking earlier about um, coaches being miked. Uh, there was the incident with the referee being miked. Maybe I should ask Shannon this question rather than Scotty. Well, I'll ask you, Bowman. Were you were you profane as a coach, or did you were you were you pretty polite with your choice of words? I never used that kind of language. No, I, I did. I, I did try to get their attention. And some of the referees I found, the top referees uh, in my day, uh, like not not to mention them all, but you know the McCreary's and those guys, Koharski and uh, Fraser, all those guys. Uh, uh, but I, I I would try to get their attention and, and, and ask them a question. And I remember I remember the best one, <laughs> Paul Dvorsky was was good because. Uh, I, I had traveled to Russia. It was during it was during one of the work stoppages or sh- strikes, or whatever they were called. And I, I remember I got to know him pretty good. We were on we were on a plane. We went to do some hockey over in, in Russia. And then I, I one night I saw him, and and he was a he was a kind of referee that controlled the game, like in, he he managed the game. And I mm-hmm. and I knew he was a, he was a good referee. And I one 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 night we were an important game and. I, I, just before the third period, I, I started, Paul, Paul, he comes over and I said, Paul, I mean, is the ball out of the whistle? I mean, you don't have any more ball in the whistle. He said, you know, how, how much do we have to take, you know? And he was so good, you know, and he said, no, he said, Scotty, it's actually there. But he said, we're not playing tennis, you know? <laughs> and and I, I, I respected those guys if they could come up with a line like that, you know? And, 
The good ones, I thought, they weren't afraid to come near the bench. They weren't afraid to talk oh, to you, yeah. and they weren't afraid to uh, listen. Uh, uh, you know, and, and that's what a good friend of mine, Bob, that I grew up uh, a little bit later than him, but I got to know him because he, he 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 refereed a little bit in uh, amateur hockey when I was in uh, just in Montreal. Jim, the late Jim McKean, the umpire. Oh yeah, and, umpire. And I and I and I know Jimmy very well. He was a good athlete, Jimmy. He was. Uh, he was on the Saskatchewan Rough Riders when they won the uh, Grey Cup. He was the mm. punter. He was a backup yeah, quarterback. 66, yeah. He was a great at Montreal athlete, and then he became an umpire. And I knew a lot of the uh, managers in the league. I knew Joe Torrey as a player, and I became pretty good friends with Joe and, and Tony Larusa, guys like that. I got, I got to know them. And I, I remember asking, I asked Joe one day, I said, Joe, a friend, because I, I was in Dallas in a playoff game, and Jimmy brought me into a ball game in the off days and he got me a pass. I went on the field and he's, he's walking around talking, introduced me to players and everything. I, I said, gee, what, a, you know, as an umpire, that's, you know, he's pretty friendly. And I, so I asked Joe, I said, Joe, uh, this guy's from my hometown. What do you think of Jimmy McKean? I, I would rate him as an umpire. Well, he said, Scotty, I'll tell you. He said, you know, maybe not in the top 10, certainly not in the bottom 10. He, I, I respected him. And, uh, Here's what he told me. He said, you know, I'd be upset at a call. I'd come out. And here's what he told me. Joe, I, I might have missed it. Or he always called me Mr. Tory. He said that was his. He said, I know it was a bit of a trick. But he said, I, that was Jim McKean. And, and the umpires, like, you know, he would say to the, to the uh, manager, uh, oh, or Mr. This, Mr. That. And, and that was, a, I think the ones, the good referees, they, they're, they're not afraid to come and talk to you, you know. And that's... Uh, I like Tim Peel. I, I, I was there. He, you know, he started around 99 because I was there when he, uh, uh, you know, when he was starting as a referee. Mm -hmm. Was there a ref that you um, had trouble with? That you had a, gr oh, yeah. had a grudge against you? Who was your guy? My guy was a good friend of mine now, Wally Harris. Oh, sure. He, he, he was from Montreal oh. and he grew up with my brother and he played junior hockey, but he never made junior A. And I used to always, I, I just, like Wally was a good referee and he managed the game. He was a, he was a lot like those older, old time referees, uh, John Ashley, you know, ones that knew how to handle it, but he didn't call penalties. He, did, he, he didn't have a strict enforcement. He let them play, but I mean, at the, at the right time, he would get them. And I, I was always... I was always wondering why did I keep getting Wally in, in games in Montreal? It's too much of a pressure on him, but he never worried about pressure. So yeah, that was the one referee. And, uh, and, and another, another good story I could tell you guys is uh, Don, Don Koharski. Uh, I, I, uh, I took over, um, I took over the, the, uh, tie, uh, the, the, the uh, Red Wings and, uh, and they lost the year before to Toronto. And, uh, and, and uh, I think they, the Red Wings were down in the sixth game. They went to Toronto and scored four power play goals. They won about seven to four, came home, and, and there was no penalties until the third period. I think uh, somebody on Detroit got a penalty, and, and the Toronto tied it up, and that Russian, is it Borakovsky? Borshevsky. Borshevsky scored the winner. And, and, you know, the Red Wings were totally upset that whole summer that that uh, that seventh game did not have any penalties and and uh so much so that they they did their best to try to get this guy out of there and now the next year i'm starting to coach on the bench and all of a sudden uh i think in the first maybe three or four times that this that co-host given it to us and i and i never had a problem with him as a referee so i called up brian lewis and i said he was the head of the referees. And I said, Brian, you know, I wasn't even here last year. I know what went on, but I mean, you know, when's it going to be uh, like, we're a month into the season. You know, when's the price been paid? And he said, what are you talking about? And I told him, stop, no, it's nothing. But he said, look, you're going to, let me look at the schedule. So Brian said, Hey, Scotty, you're going to Montreal uh, uh, to play them. And uh, uh, he's doing the game. Cole's got that game. It was about 10 days later. Uh, why, don't, why don't I arrange a, uh, a meeting with in the morning that you could go over to his because I was staying we we're staying in, in near the near the same hotel but he was at the Marriott there near the near the Bell Center now so I went over there and uh, 
had a coffee, went I'm up to Don's room and had a coffee and, uh, and, I, and it was nice. And I said, Don, you know, I mean, I, I respect as a referee, but I, I, I mean, I, I know what happened last year, but it's over now. And, and uh, so he, I said, you know, and we're, and you know, when is it over? And he said, uh, I got, he said, Scotty, I, I got, I got nothing against anybody. He said, growing up in the Maritimes, he said, you know why I wear number 12? I said, no, I don't, no, no, no. I, he said, my favorite player was Evan Cornway. And I, and I stopped for him and he said, I, I admired your teams in, in the 70s. And I said, Don, we're playing tonight and Evan Cornway still works for Canadians. So I, I said, let's, let's, not, let's not carry it any further. But that was a true story. So, you know, they have to have, it's a tough job. And, uh, but I get along. I, I like to talk to them now. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the world of social media now? It got out that the head coach of an NHL team was <laughs> having a coffee in the morning with 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 the guy refereeing the game that night. Could you imagine yeah. that? Oh. Yeah, but, but try no. I'm trying to clear the air, John. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian Lewis, Brian Lewis said, you know, I can arrange a meeting because you know he oh. backed he backed his referees. You know, Brian was a, was a supervisor. Oh, that was good. Well, I, if, you, are you, if you, sorry, John, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please go. Well, I'm going to laugh just, all day. I, I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on this relationship between coaches and referees thing. Sure. So, if you had a hassle, if you had a problem with a particular guy, could you call the office and you knew this guy was going to work the game two nights from now against you? Could you call the office and say, "Look, I got a problem with this guy"? I mean, they would tell you to, you know, yeah, tell you to buzz it, off. Right? Yeah, I, I don't. No, uh, that was an unusual circumstance, and I, and I, I had been in the league a long time, but I didn't, I, you know, I didn't. I mean, I, I just felt. I mean, I, I liked them as a referee, and I, I wanted to clear the air. But no, I don't. I mean, they've got their mechanics now. The way that they they put referees in, they uh, they can. I, I think they make a schedule, but they, they they'll parachute a, a certain referee into a game, but only because he's more experienced or something. It was a crucial game in the play. They'll, they'll juggle the playoffs uh, if they think that uh, they, they have to, but no, I wouldn't, I, the league can't do that now. No. Hey, Bob, hey, Bob, listen, yeah. I, when, when you asked it, when you asked uh, Scotty about who his favorite referee was, the first mind guy that came to mind for me, was not in Scotty's scenario was Doug Risebrow, who was coaching Calgary. And he had a real difficulty with one ref constantly had problems with one referee, Terry mm-hmm. Gregson. Oh, and you know why, Bob? It's his brother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> and and there you'd see you'd see his shots of Doug on the bench yelling, and Terry's in the corner. He's got his hands on his knees. His his jaw is out. I'm not going near him. You know. Oh, the, I used to love those stories. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, as you look around the National Hockey League these days, I know you get to see. You're still going to Tampa. Well, you don't go to Tampa games. No, anymore, I, I'm going to go up maybe this week for the first time. But are you? They're, they're putting fans in now. Yeah. Yeah. Handful anyway, right? Uh, but I think they're up to maybe 20 percent in Florida. Wow, it's yeah. amazing. I think it's around thirty five hundred. Yeah. Um, but you watch so much. Is who's the best team right now, or can you tell? Well. Um, Tampa's got a lot on the, on their plate right now. They got a couple of injuries, but they're they're so solid, Bob. They got they got the big four. To, they got three. The, when you look at Sergachev and McDonough and Hedman, you know, and even even uh, Chernak, they, they, mm-hmm. they they're big guys. They they pinch in. They can they can they can skate. Like you know, picking up McDonough was a terrific pickup for uh, Steve Eiserman and Julian Breezeball when they made that trade. I'm I was always surprised why the Rangers really traded them, you know, but I guess it was all about money and that's what happens. A lot of these deals, but I like their team a lot um, they, I, because of the goaltending. They play a lot different than they were. They, they're kind of battle worn. They've had some setbacks. They got Kucherov coming back. Uh, you know, what, what, how, how much is he going to be uh, what he is? He's a tremendous player, but you know, uh, there's some other teams that, that are going to give them a run. I mean, it's just, totally different format this year because you know you're going to run into a pretty good team in the second round for sure the way that the, they got their thing set up one three two four 
in the West, it's going to be a, I really don't know how teams are going to dislodge um, uh, Vegas and Colorado. That's mm-hmm. quite a, that's yeah. quite a series. I, I mean, I watch their, I watch their games and uh, it's a, such a skillful team. Uh, um, Colorado, can they, can they withstand the, the pressures and, and the, the toughness of, of NHL hockey in the playoffs? That's, and, and, you know, Vegas has got, they, 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 I think they've played each other this year six times and it's like three, two in a shootout. So mm-hmm. it's really close. And uh, they got one more game, two more games, I guess. But no, it's uh, they, those, they're, they're really elite teams. But I find the Canadian, I find like Edmonton and, and uh, Winnipeg and Toronto, uh, it, it, they're high paced games. And that's the way when, when uh, Vegas plays against uh, Colorado. I, I and how's how they? I don't even know the playoffs though, John. Like when they don't do they know that the Canadian division winners are gonna? They don't. They haven't decided they what which uh, which team is gonna play to which division. I don't think have they. No, it's uh, by points. In the end, it'll be uh, the, like the top four will just be seeded by points. Oh, I thought it was by the division winner. Oh, so the division nope. winner goes into a one. Oh, I'm glad to know that. So when, when, I, when you yeah, when you get to the third round. The four teams that came out of all four divisions just we get seated by points. That's kind of, you know, yeah. If you're in a, if you're in an easier division, though, you wouldn't you have more chance. But it, but it may, but it may not be people either, though. So it's not as it's not the same as a normal season. We don't know well, that. Yeah, essentially, what they've done here is they've eliminated the conferences. And yeah. when you eliminate the conferences, it doesn't, yeah. you know, you're not predetermining. Well, who's going to play. And we, they, listen, we, we, we still haven't determined whether a Canadian team can play in Canada in the third round. So, well, yeah, they're, that they're, looks, I would say that's, that's right. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, a team like St. Louis uh, could, like, they're going to end up playing. I mean, if they get the playoffs, if they get in the playoffs. And that's, that's what's, what I look at these teams now, Bob, is, you know, in a, in a space of, of, of two years now, they lost a really steady defenseman, Bo Mister. They lost through the free agency, Peter Angelo, and now they, they had an injury to Pareko. And, and if you look at the St. Louis Blues when they won the cup two years ago, they weren't a high scoring team, but they had a big defense and they were, they, they, they were, they were tough to beat. They, they didn't score a lot of goals. They're not scoring a lot of goals. They're playing pretty good hockey right now, but they're not scoring a lot of goals. Now they'd have to get really I mean, they, they, they really have to score more goals. St. Louis is a team, though, that has been there two years ago, but the, the team has changed, but they still have most of the same forwards, and they don't, they, don't, they don't give up a lot of chances, but it's a problem, can they score enough goals? And in the playoffs, you know, those low-scoring games, they could, they could be a rival for Colorado and, and uh, Vegas if they get in. they got to make sure they get in first. You talk about Vegas and Colorado. Uh, I don't know if you watched the Vegas game last night. Uh, 20, uh, t- the third period last right. night, Scotty. Yeah. Uh, it was a 20 minute period, obviously. It took 24 minutes to play. Yeah, they, uh, I think they, there they, were, I think were five, five whistles in total. One of them wow. was a goal, one was a penalty, and three icings. It was so fast. It was crazy. But they're going to slow that down. And, see, that's racetrack hockey, but. I don't know. That's the thing with Vegas, with uh, Colorado. I really like a lot of this. Their defense is so skillful. Uh, they got a great, great player in McCarr. But in the playoffs, it, it's a different kind of hockey. You don't get the chance to, it's like a horse that just, you know, you let him run. But in the playoffs, you can't do that, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. But they, they, they've had a great year. The goalies had five or six shutouts, I think, uh, group hour. He's never had a long playoff run. But uh, that, that's something you got to wait and see. But they got so much skill. Uh, we could be here all day, and uh, we've, uh, we've <laughs> barely scratched the surface, but uh, we'll do it again soon. We thank you, as always, for taking a few minutes for us, uh, Mr. Bowman. And uh, nice stay, to stay healthy. We'll see you soon. I will. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. There he is, the legendary Scotty Bowman. We'll come back with more in a minute. McCowan and Shannon, back with you uh, again. Our thanks to Scotty Bowman for joining us. Rarely a dull moment. Isn't it great? Isn't it great? He just, you know, you can say one thing to Scotty, and you, you know, like if he was your navigator in your car, you'd be turning all the time. <laughs> well, you know, you do enough interviews. I, I don't even know how many interviews I've done, but ten I mean, thousand. It's t- literally tens of thousands. Yeah. And what are you looking for? 
Well, really, you're looking for a guy who will take the ball and run with it by himself and will tell stories. Sure. I mean, nothing perks you up as an interviewer more than a guy who's sitting there and says, well, I got to tell you this story. This, this is what happened to me, blah, blah, blah. Because you know it's going to be good. And wow. Bowman all, invariably does that for you. And um, so we love having him on. I hope uh, the audience enjoyed uh, listening to him. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing, Bob. Scotty loves coming on. Scotty loves we love to talk, that loves we to talk can, and tell stories. And, yeah. we can, and, we can, and we can challenge him. Scotty was tough to work with beside him, tough to work with when, when he was the coach and I was the lowly producer, but he, he loves it now. He just, he loves talking about his life and his career and what he's contributed to the game. It's so much fun. Well, and that's plenty. Uh, Yesterday, Matt Devlin was on with us, the um, play-by-play voice of the uh, Toronto Raptors celebrating his 1000th regular season game for the Raptors. The Raptors. And, uh, you know, I love Devlin, um, uh, but he is, um, for lack of a better term, an apologist for the team. And, and I, I, I get why, um, you know, he does the play-by-play for them. He works for MLSE. Um, he's not an apologist, Bob. Come on. He's not. Well, he's, he's. He looks at the world through Raptor glasses. No, he works. He looks through the, the world through Raptor glasses. That's well, he's an optimist. As most of the people, least. as most of the as most of the people who listen to this uh, this uh, podcast do. So. What, what do the people who? They, they look at the world through Raptor glasses. Well, but They're I don't not care very critical that. of the Raptors. They're not critical of the Raptors. Very well, often. and I'm not here to be critical of the Raptors. I'm here to be honest, if I can be. And I know p- some people will take issue with that and suggest that I'm critical all the time of everything. And there may be some truth in that, but... Um, let's let's face reality. I, I tried to uh, promote the theory that the Raptors are in deep doo-doo and might very well not make the playoffs, even though they've expanded it to 10 teams from the normal eight. And um, Matty D yesterday was supportive of the notion, oh, they can still make it. He was even talking about sixth place. And then I watched our other friend Grange on television last night you know, spewing the same kind of stuff, which quite frankly is nonsense. And last night's game didn't do anything but endorse my position on it. You can't lose two games to Detroit like this. You can't. They've lost Detroit. three already this year to Detroit or four. I don't yeah, but the know. Last, but the last two in the last, what, how many hours? Well, what is it now? 14 out of 16 losses. They, they're two yeah. and 14 in their last 16 yeah. games. Yeah. And this team does not. But work. Kyle's still here. Kyle's still here, so it's okay. Yeah, well, um, and I tried to raise the issue and didn't get far enough yesterday with, okay, right off this year, fine, it, it happens. Maybe it was COVID, maybe it was this, maybe it was that, but I, I don't know. I don't know how, you're, how you can look forward to next year with this nucleus. You have to, you're going to have to open up the purse strings somehow, some way and find a way, you know, to, well, if you keep to, Kyle to, to Lowry, attract a free have, agent. If you keep Kyle Lowry, which would be the popular sentiment, would you agree? That's what the fan base would want you to do. You have I, no I, money to go get anybody yeah, else. I think there's some sentimentalists that want to keep him. I am not one of those. I don't think you are one of those. And I think there's lots of smart basketball fans in Canada that feel the same way we do. Well, I'm just not comfortable that, you know, I know everybody loves OG Ananobi. I'm not among them. I just, I think he's a, he's a, a decent player, maybe even a good player. I don't see anything more than that. What about Pascal? Very disappointing. Uh, thought he was on the verge of stardom and um, mm-hmm. he hasn't mater- that hasn't materialized. And Van Vliet drives me nuts. I love, I love the shot. But when but he penetrates, it's all about roles. It's all about roles, Bob. Well, when you he put pen- him in the right role, you got to put him in the right la- role. How many times last night did he penetrate, go underneath the basket, and have nowhere to go, or get his shot blocked? And then he falls on his ass and is looking for a foul every time you turn around, and he never gets that call. So, um, you know, a lot of money spent on guys, and not one of them is elevating themselves to the point where they can lead this team. I mean. 
if Kyle Lowry isn't the leader, I don't know who is. And he is he is the leader, and but he's the guy we'd be most likely to give up. No. Tell you what, this this team right now is going to go from crisis to crisis. The, the last crisis says whether Kyle is here or Kyle's not. The next crisis, and they have to address it sooner than later, I think, is is where's Masai in the, all of this, and they have to address it. And it'll that that will now be now the fact that it looks like they're not making the playoffs. You know, um, that will be the issue that will govern every almost every conversation between now and well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Yeah, but is Masai going to be here or not? You know, fix your cut bait. Fisher cut bait. That's that's really in the end. I think that'll be the simple storyline for basketball in Toronto. We got to get out of here, but I mean, it'll be interesting to see whether Masai's um, value to the organization, if he hasn't signed his contract yet, um, is as much as it was at the end of last year. We got to go uh, for John Shannon, Bob McCown. We'll see you tomorrow. If the prick don't rise, goodbye, everybody.